Good morning, everyone. So, as you might have noticed, Judy is unfortunately ill today. So, we have our longtime companion, Janet Douglas, back with us to help lead the service. And so, I guess that for now, I'm going to do Judy's part of starting us off with the hymns. So, if you would like to, please join us for hymn 3152 in the green book. It'll be up on the screens, and it's also in the book if you need the text. Let's walk together for a while and ask where we begin. Let's build the world where love can grow and help can enter in. To be the hands of healing.
The last hymn is also from the Blue Book, and it's one, four, five. Morning has broken. joining us from home via our Ustream channel. For those of you who are worshiping with us for the first time or for the first time in a while, we have a to tell you about some of the things that our congregation does and there are a lot of things that we do and they're a lot of fun and some of them are, are very special and outreaching. And we ask that all of you please take a moment and fill out our welcome sheets at some point during our time together this morning. They're attached to the clipboards in your pews. There is room for any prayer requests that you'd like to share with us, and we would love to add your concerns to our prayers. Pastor Judy uses these sheets during the week to pray for each and every one of you. After worship, we hope you will join us for refreshments in our Wesley room, right out that way. Um, you'll find wonderful snacks there, including some that are taken people with food allergies. And now, let us join in a responsive call to worship. During this season of Lent, the words of St. Francis, excuse me, Pope Francis asked, do you want to fast this Lent? Fast from hurting words and say kind words. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from anger and be filled with patience. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from sadness and be filled with gratitude. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from pessimism and be filled with hope. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from worries and trust in God. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from complaints and contemplate simplicity. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from pressures and be prayerful. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from bitterness and fill your hearts with joy. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from selfishness and be compassionate to others. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from grudges and be reconciled. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. Fast from words and be silent so you can listen. God, in your mercy, help us so to live. 
Thank you. And now, we're going to be a little noisy, though, and pass the piece. <laughs> In all the um, excitement of getting ready for this service um, and, and getting here and getting started today, I did not pick up the children's time book, so I'm going to ask your forgiveness that there isn't a children's time today. Um, as you heard, Pastor Judy is not well and she contacted me on Friday night, so for all of those who are in worship planning, 
Um, I did my best with your theme and, 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 the, and what you gave me. I'm sure it's not going to be anything like what you expected, and I do apologize. Uh, so, but uh, because um, it's the way that we, I tended to do things when I was here, we have various people taking part today. And although we don't have a children's time, you are not just going to have to listen to just my voice. You'll be glad to know because um, others will be praying. After we sing our next song, Marilyn is going to actually be doing our prayers for us. So I invite you to remain seated and we'll sing, Lord, listen to your children. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning in worship. We thank you for each one here and for each one at home. We ask that you would be with those who cannot be here for whatever the reasons. We think of the names on the prayer list that are in the bulletin. You know the needs, whether they be for healing, for strength, for comfort. We ask that those needs would be met. And Lord, you also know the needs and the names that are written on our hearts and minds, perhaps not in the bulletin and perhaps not known to too many others, but we do ask that you would help us to keep them in prayer also and be with those. Especially, Lord, we think not only this morning, but have been thinking for a time period of the families and the wives in Florida that have been so affected by the recent tragedy. There's no way we can possibly comprehend and understand. We only can go forward and try so hard to keep those in prayer and ask that you would help those families to deal with the loss that they've suffered, to deal with the feelings and emotions that are so unexpected and have become a part of their lives right now. The Lord, only you can provide the comfort and the help that is so much needed. But if there's any way at all in which any of us or family, clergy, friends, people around them, can provide your love and your strength and your help. We ask that that would happen. Lord, we have so many other things that we think about today, especially during this time of Lent and preparation. We think also, Lord, of an event going on in literally almost the other side of the world with the Olympics, the opportunities for people to get together, to get to know each other, hopefully most of the time in an atmosphere of peace and togetherness. And we ask that in some way your presence would be felt there also, that you would touch hearts and lives that perhaps do not expect to be touched. And that, Lord, as we come to you and so often and pray for world peace, it's, it's a great opportunity for that peace and that love to be brought to different people and to be affected. We thank you for this season. We look at the snow outside this morning and realize that through that snow will come, as depicted on the screen, the flowers of spring. How they managed to do it, is beyond our understanding sometimes. 
but from what seems to be absolute light, lack of light, you do bring life. And we thank you for that. We ask again in this time of Lent that you would help us to prepare ourselves for the coming of Easter, for the coming of, of the newness of life that Easter represents. And help us at all times, Lord, to remember that so many of these, if not all of these good things, do come from you. And help us to be aware and to be thankful for that. As we continue to pray now in the words that Jesus gave us to his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The scripture this morning is John 11, verse 1 through 7 and 17 through 44. A certain man, Lazarus, was ill. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. This was to Mary, who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill, so the sister sent word to Jesus, saying, Lord, the one whom you love is ill. When he heard this, Jesus said, this illness isn't fatal. It's for the glory of God, so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. After two days, he said to his disciples, let's return to Judea again. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus was all, had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Mary heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, while Mary stayed behind in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the wreck resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, God's son, the one who is coming into the world. After she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister Mary. The teacher is here, and he's calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. He hadn't entered the village, but was still in the place where Martha had been in. When the Jews who were comforting Mary in the house saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her. They assumed she was going to mourn the tomb. Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him. She fell at his feet and said, Lord, you have been me, my brother. Jesus saw her crying, and the Jews who were crying also. He was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, Where have they where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, See how much you loved him? But some of them said, He opened the eyes of a man for him come. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from that? Dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone covered the entrance. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, 
Lord, the smell will be awful. He's been dead for four days. Jesus replied, Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. I say this for the benefit of the crowd standing here, so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his feet bound and his hands tied, and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're not sure if this is going to stay working when Lee was using it and it started to flash. If that's the case, I'll move over to the lectern over here. It's good to be with you. Um, it was a surprise, but it's a, I'm, and I'm very sorry that it should come because your pastor is sick. But I'm certainly happy to be with you. We are, you're going through a whole series of readings and studies and messages and sermons based on the book of John, the Gospel of John. John is the fourth gospel. Um, I like to kind of repeat this because we presume everyone knows, but maybe not everyone does. There are four gospels. They all tell a story about Jesus, but they all tell a little bit different story. Only two of them, for example, have birth stories. John does not. Three of those gospels, the first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a similar way of looking at things. They, they kind of have more or less the same order. They have similar stories, sometimes have the same stories, sometimes with a slightly different conclusion. Some, each of them has something that's a little bit unique. But then there's the fourth gospel. So those first three gospels, which tend to be fairly brief in their telling of what's going on, are very, very different from John's. Now, that reading, and you'll remember the Samaritan woman, the reading a couple of weeks ago, was a long reading. This one, we, the, the worship team took a chunk right out the middle to stop it being even longer. John is wordy. John, I think John and I would probably, well, the writer of John and me would have gotten very well, because I'm wordy too. Or maybe not, you know, maybe we would have fought for the, the airtime, I don't know. But John likes to put great detail. It's almost as if he's writing a little piece, of, a, a story with everything he writes. There's always lots of conversation, lots of back and forth, lots of commentary about what's going on. And John is unique in other ways. John is not only lengthy in the terms of conversations and have these longer, John is also a very thoughtful gospel. There's been time for this author to kind of work things out and say, this is the significance of these events. These events are not simply scrabbled down. Now, it has to be said that there are those who believe that some parts of John are very, very early. They come from a very early tradition. But it's certainly the case that John of the four Gospels is the most Greek. It's the one that's been in the Greek world the longest. It has the best Greek. When you're learning Greek, they actually give you the first letter of John and the book of John as the first things you read because they're the actually the most conforming Greek in the New Testament. And the last thing you do is Revelation because it, the Greek is just terrible. Maybe, maybe some of it intentionally so. The, the thought is the more recent thought is. But nonetheless, it's very difficult to read when Greek is not a language that's natural to you. So it's good Greek. So this person who is writing this knows Greek well. This other, but there's other things too. Although these parts, that, there are parts that do seem to be very early, particularly the topography, the geography is very, very accurate, and like the other Gospels, it has been written 70 or 75 years later, where that influence of the Greek world has come in, and so there's a lot of structure to this Gospel. It, it reads a lot like Greek literature of that period and the 200 years before it. It's sophisticated, it's structured, and it has developed characters. A lot of what we know of the disciples actually comes from what the author of John tells us. And then we kind of know it when we're reading those other Gospels, but we find it out from John who develops his characters. We know about doubting Thomas from the Gospel of John because he's just a name in a list in those other three Gospels. 
And although Peter is seen to fail in the other Gospels, it's really in John where Peter is seen to fail again and again and again. If we had no John's Gospel, we would never have heard about Nicodemus. Nicodemus is the man that there's another long conversation with in chapter 3 of John's Gospel. He's the one where Jesus tells him he has to be born again. You remember him? The chapter before, the Samaritan woman. We wouldn't know about the Samaritan woman if it wasn't for John's Gospel. Another well-described personality in this Gospel. And in fact, two of the other men in these miracles, which John calls signs, two of those only appear in the Gospel of John. You see, when Matthew, Mark, and Luke talk about miracles, John talks about signs. It's a very different Greek word. He never mentions the word miracle. And if you think about it, what does the sign do? If the, if the trustees say, hey, we need new signage, why do you want new signage? What would they do that for? What do you need a sign for? What did you say? Directions, okay. All right, so you might want to sign to the restroom, the offices, you know. Pardon? Yeah, it's a label. It's in, but it, and it's a pointer. It points out the way to go. It's a, it's, as Lee said, it's a direction. They, they, you want to go in a certain direction. John wants to lead the people hearing and reading his gospel in a certain direction. He wants to point to something. So he has seven signs. The first one is regarded as the first miracle. People always call it that, but it's not. It's the first sign. <laughs> and it's changing the water into wine at the wedding in Cana. It's supposedly Jesus, the first time Jesus kind of is outed by his mother, it says, of course. Um, he's told, they've run out of wine at the wedding, and they, she comes up to him and says, hey, you know, do something about this. Um, so there's all kinds of theories why she and Jesus are involved in that, but that's the first sign. The second one is the healing of the son, of the royal official's son in Capernaum, in John 4. There's the healing of the paralytic at Bethesda in John 5. There's the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, a story that we know in all four Gospels, the only one of these miracles slash signs that appears in all four Gospels. There's Jesus walking on the water in John 6, healing the blind man from birth in John 9, and raising Lazarus, the piece we get to today, in chapter 11. All of these are designated signs. There are no other miracles in the Gospel of John. And what these Gospel signs do is they point us to something in Jesus. They point us to help us make a, con a, a conclusion who Jesus is. It's about the nature of Jesus. But this author wants us to make a judgment. Whether they are healing someone or creating something, they're not done so much for the immediate need in front of Jesus, which is certainly what is the case in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are there to make a point. This is how you know Jesus is the one. John's Gospel is extreme. It's full of superlatives to make that point. Jesus is just super. He's the one. When Jesus turns the water into wine at the wedding in Cana, that first sign, he doesn't make enough just to get everyone through the rest of the wedding. He takes some dirty water sitting in water jars this tall, and he turns that dirty water into 850 bottles of wine. That is extreme. <laughs> John doesn't only tell us this rather extreme version of everything. He seems to be able to take it aim at anyone in his gospel who takes what he says literally. When Jesus talks to Nicodemus about being born again, and Nicodemus just doesn't get it, and he wants to know if he's supposed to crawl back up and actually be given birth to again, the Gospel writer kind of scoffs at him, like mocks him for even thinking it. How could you? And when the woman at the well, when Jesus tells her, hey, I can give you living water and you will never have to come back to this well again, she goes, ooh, how can you? You've not even got a jog. And Jesus is like, what? I'm not 
talking about that, <laughs> right? John's Gospel says to us, don't take me literally. I've got a bigger story to tell you. I've got a more important story to tell you. This is sophisticated Greek literature. He wants you to know that he's writing that. The conversations are longer. Who would remember them like that? This is the early church saying, this is who Jesus is to us. This is who Jesus showed us to be. And this is how we're telling you this story. This was not literally taken down as a, as a dictation. These are crafted stories because they've had 70 or 75 years in order for the church to write them down so they have meaning. And there are so many other differences. Do you know the mother of Jesus has never given a name in the fourth gospel? I mentioned there was no birth story, but I'd never noticed until I did this research. I had a blast yesterday, <laughs> doing, just reading all day for this. Um, but Mary never gets a name. There are Marys in the gospel. You just heard about the other Mary just getting a mention, or maybe two. Well, there's an argument whether it's one or two others. But, um, the mother of Jesus is never given a name in the fourth gospel. There's a very interesting theory about that too. And, she even, and she's only on this gospel does the mother of Jesus show up at the cross. That's interesting, isn't it? In Matthew, Mark and Luke, the mother of Jesus does not go to the cross when he is crucified. And in fact, one of the hugest differences is the way the crucifixion is portrayed in the Gospel of John, where it is not tragedy, but victory. Everything about what happens at the cross when Jesus died in John's Gospel is triumph. It is what is meant to happen. It is not disaster. So the Mary in this Gospel, and you just heard a little bit about her, and some will argue that she is very much the same as the other Mary that does get a mention in the Gospel of John. Her name was Mary Great Tower. Mary the Great is what she was called in, by some in the early church, and we know her as Mary Magdalene. This Gospel, too, has a lot about Mary Magdalene and very much more detail about her. It also has two God disciples that we never hear about in the other Gospels. Um, one is called Nathaniel, doesn't show up in any of the other Gospels at all. And another is a mysterious figure who dominates the last third of the Gospel of John, who's called the disciple Jesus loved. And there have been shell, there are shelfuls of books written about who this person is, this disciple who Jesus loved. And one of the mysteries lies in the reading we just heard. Until we get to the Gospel of John, this fourth Gospel, and, and at the point where we get to this, we have heard about Mary and Martha. In Luke, we hear that, uh, and I'm just going to read this from Luke chapter 10. It says, Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying, but Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to Jesus and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. Where's Lazarus? Where is Lazarus? If he lived in that house, that would be the house of Lazarus, not the house of Martha. If he lived nearby, you'd think Lazarus might have shown up somewhere in three Gospels. Hmm. This Lazarus, who we're told Jesus loves so much in this Gospel story of John, he's not there. Now, there is a poor man in one of the Gospels um, called Lazarus. Uh, there's a story of a poor man sitting at the gate of a rich man called Dives, and there's a Lazarus there, but that's a story. That's quite definitely a story, but there's no person called Lazarus in those other three Gospels. Now, I love a mystery. 
I love mysteries whether I read them, whether I see them on TV, in fact, Lee, who you heard from earlier, is my um, closet, co-closet dweller at the homeless shelter. We um, have an office that was a closet, it has no window. And, uh, and one of the things we ended up talking about as Lee was leaving the other day was different murder mystery type things on television that we both like. I'm trying to persuade her to, to watch Death in Paradise. She's still not watched it. If you watch that, tell her she has to watch it. Because um, it's very good. I like it. It's like a game of Clue to me. Um, I love it. Um, but, you know, this, I like them all. I just, you know, right from Kate Cadfell way back, and Miss Marple and Poirot, the whole lot. I love those. But the thing is that I just love a mystery, period. Um, if there's, a, if there's a, something I don't know in genealogy, I, I have to work it out, right? I just can't not. When I, I never met any of my grandparents, and I preached on this here years ago. When I eventually got my grandfather's name, and we couldn't find him anywhere, my daughter had been doing this genealogy, and she went through everything. We could not even find that the man existed. We knew he existed. Uh, my sister did meet him. I just did not. And so... We went over to London, and I, it was before I had working papers, so I just said to my daughter, I am coming and living in with you, and we are going to the Genealogical Society in London every single day until we track down this man, because it was driving me insane. I could find no record he ever existed. And that's what we did until we found him. <laughs> we found Cecil David. It was a great day of great triumph. Um, I can't stand the mystery. And I can't, I can't say it in my family, and my family's got so many mysteries, I can tell you it's got so many mysteries, but neither can I stand a mystery in the Bible. It's why I love Bible study. The Bible is full of half-said things, kind of things that are said that aren't quite right, and you know it, so you have to do it. There are times when the Bible contradicts itself, and that's why I love Bible study, because I get to work out why, what's going on. So here we have Lazarus. I have never, in 30-something years of preaching, preached on this text. And I, be, I was given this text on Friday night, and I thought, wow. I don't know if I really want to do it. I mean, presumably if I've avoided it for 35 years, I didn't really want to do it, right? But, but I had so much fun, because what's going on with this Lazarus that nobody knows about until you get to this passage of this gospel? So Jesus, we are told, has this extra special friend, and he's the only one we hear of who Jesus loves. Jesus loves Jesus, loves Jesus, loved him. Gosh, didn't Jesus love this man, this man Lazarus? We're told that this is the only person who gets Jesus to weep. This is the only verse my, my father knew in the whole Bible. Jesus wept, but he didn't use it in quite the right way. But that's the shortest verse in the, in the old version of the Bible. The only two verse sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus weeps over this man, not over anyone else. Jesus has died. Uh, sorry, Lazarus has died, and Jesus is told he's, has been told he was sick, and he waits. And he waits to go. Hmm. Now the inter traditional interpretation of this text is that here we have a foretaste of what is going to happen to Jesus in just a little while. Lazarus is put into a tomb, Lazarus is uh, resuscitated, Lazarus walks again. That is the traditional understanding. And today is that first day of Lent, and it's certainly a day when we remember, and the early church has always started that to make that journey of Jesus from preacher and teacher to Jesus who will be taken to the cross. So I, I changed the pyramids to purple, the altar cloths and things. Purple is the colour of Lent. It's the colour, and he's actually wearing purple, I say. I, I didn't, I nearly did and didn't. Um, I wear purple so much, <laughs> but not because of Lent. Purple is the, the colour of mourning. And the reason why, you know, you, Advent used to always be purple and pink candles, and the reason they changed that was that it's the colour of mourning for, in the early church. And Advent isn't a time of mourning, it's a time of deep thought and preparation, but not mourning. And so a lot of people in the church turn to a blue for Advent. Dark violet 
the color of the summer sky in the middle of June in Britain when it never gets quite dark. I love this dark violet color very much. And there's only two people in the whole of the New Testament who wear this color in the gospel stories. One is that Dives, that rich man I mentioned um, with the poor man called Lazarus at his gate. And the other is Jesus when the Roman soldiers mocking Jesus lay on him a robe of deep violet to mock the fact that he has been called the king of the Jews. It's the color of royalty. So the six weeks of Lent was a time and has been in the church a time of preparation for baptism in the early centuries of our faith and a time for reconciliation of people who committed serious sins could show that they were once more uh, going to kind of, you know, fall in line with the rest of the Christian church and they could be entered by. Back in, received back in on Easter Day. But in that first Easter, this is the time when the tension is mounting between the Roman and the temple authorities and Jesus and his disciple. This incident happens just before Jesus walks back into Jerusalem, where in just days he would be executed Roman style as an insurgent and therefore on a cross which was the way that Romans dealt with their political enemies, especially their non-violent political enemies. Jesus is going to be an example to others, not to speak ill of their overlords. So that orthodox view is that this is a foreshadowing of what is, will happen to Jesus, and as, and as such it's meant to prepare his followers for his death, his burial, and his resurrection on what we call Easter morning. And if that works for you, that's great. I want to emphasize, you can take this story as written, but not everyone can. Because for some of us, it doesn't quite work. If you want to be precise, Lazarus is not resurrected. He's still a human being. He's still going to have to die like everyone else. He's not a resurrected man. That's Jesus. Lazarus isn't res resurrected. He's, he's resuscitated. Oh, and I love this word, revivified. I tried to say that smiling. You can't say revivified smiling. It's just one of those words. But if this story is not about resurrection, then what is it about? Well, what I do, what seems to be my mission, what excites me in our faith is this. I help people see the good and the relevance in the biblical stories that intellectually they cannot connect with. Some can see this story through the eyes of faith, and it's not an issue to see Lazarus as a gentle introduction to the devastating events that lie ahead, but there are others who simply cannot. And I do not want those people to give up on the Jesus story and the Jesus way of life. I think the Jesus way of life is not only a wonderful model, it is the pattern for my life. Jesus is the one I follow, the one I want to be like. I want others to see Jesus as still important, still valuable. And so if you don't have a problem with this story, just feel free to you know, read, the, read in the hymnal or read your Bible and think that I'm just being totally plain wacko at this point. Because... So, you know, before you tune out, I'm going to give you a, a, a Greek lesson. I'll have Paul put up uh, a picture. So I want to make sure those of you who are about to tune out, because you think I really am nuts at this point, um, I'm going to have uh, at least get you something valuable from this so you can wow somebody over lunch or dinner later, tell them that you know some Greek. Uh, what's this? What else? If you call this at a, at a, at a if somebody uses this at a rally or something, a megaphone. Okay, next slide. Right, megaphone. Right, put it on the next one. Big voice. It's a big voice. When Jesus goes to the tomb of Lazarus and he stands outside, the Greek says he uses a megaphone. Because you pronounce the e. A megaphone, eh? he uses a big voice. So the next time someone has a megaphone at one of those sports matches, you say, hey, did you know that that means, in Greek, big voice? Okay. So, for those of you who want to tune out, hymnals, Bibles, whatever you like, probably not your grocery list, but, you know, I'm not going to come and take your phone off you. Um, so this is what I want to say.
say to those of you who have a problem with this story, taking it as it is, when Jesus walks up to the tomb of Lazarus and he uses that megaphone, that big voice, you can take that off now, Paul, it's fine. <laughs> and Lazarus comes out. What is John, the writer of John, trying to say? Well, in our reading today, we heard that Jesus gets a message, his friend, so one he loves so much, is sick. He goes delaying, he delays going to his side. Um, and this man, who we've never heard of, this brother of Mary and Martha, who we already know, um, it seems is left to die. Jesus doesn't go there. In fact, he ignores this whole situation for a couple more days. And with travel time, he arrives four days after his great friend's death. Now here John is making a point again. This is an exaggeration. This is how early the uh, people in, in Palestine knew this was a story. We would say once upon a time. They just tell silly, exaggerated stories. Nobody goes, oh, it's a story. So he waits four days. In, in Jewish society at the time, for three days, the, somebody's spirit kind of hovered around them for about three days. But after four days, you know, somebody's well and truly dead. So he waits for four days to make sure this Lazarus is dead. It's exaggeration again. And there's some interesting dynamics here. Because when Jesus does show up, he gets kind of chided by Martha. Mary refuses to go at all. What's going on there? This, this weird, this is almost like family, and I'm sure that's what Judy was, was going to allude to from other things. And so this is like, he knows these people very well, and they know Jesus very well. This, this, this criticism, Martha criticizes Jesus. Why didn't you get here? Um, great familiarity. And there's something else that seems to be going on. There's almost... When you read the, the bits that we missed, the verses, there is something going on between Mary and Jesus where they seem to have had some kind of fight. How do we explain this? I'm indebted to the scholarship yet again in my preaching career of the work of retired Bishop John Shelby Spong. In a recent book summarized in some videos on YouTube from his talks at Chautauqua a year or two ago, he helps us to wade through all this information. Spong reminds us that while we... Uh, People, we are telling the story by that once upon a time. John tells it through exaggeration, 180 gallons of wine, a man in a tomb for four days. He keeps coming back to the, uh, uh, he kept found that as he was studying as John's boss, he kept coming back to this tiny little sentence in a commentary written in 1907. The author, a very great theologian, Paul Bultman, had, like others before, tried to link Lazarus with that beloved disciple, the disciple Jesus loved. And he kept going back to Lazarus and saying, there's something else happening. Lazarus is loved, loved, beloved. The beloved disciple, the one Jesus loved, the one laying on his breast at the Last Supper, the one who is there with the mother of Jesus at the cross. There's something going on here with Lazarus and this beloved disciple, and I have to tell you, so many people have had given so many names to who that disciple is. But John Spong goes back to this again and again, and he says there's something here, and Bultman said, I think that John is telling us Lazarus is not real. But Lazarus is real in that he is meant to be the example of the perfect disciple. And when Jesus sees us as the perfect disciple, Jesus sees us as the one trying our best to be like Jesus. Jesus loves us and will weep for us when we fail and will keep on trying and trying to help us be that best we can be. That Lazarus is our symbol, our symbol of people who are having a hard time getting it right, but trying and trying and trying again, and willing to get up and try again when we fail. Jesus is calling us into a whole new way of being. He talks about it as dying to this life and being born again. Lazarus comes out of his tomb ready to try again. 
So what's my take on Pastor Judith's title for this service? What is the unexpected life? Well, for me who spends my spare time digging into what we know about this rather obscure Jewish rabbi from a long time ago and a long way away, the surprising life, the unexpected life has to be Jesus. But how did he spend his time and who with, both during and before his ministry? Who is this man who became the Christ for billions of people through the ages? We don't really know. We can assume some parts of it from what we read, but there's a lot more story, a lot more mystery there. Jesus has an unexpected life, a life that we cannot know, and sometimes we get a clue. I think if we think of Jesus as an unexpected life, then what we can remember is that in many ways Jesus did appear to be just like everyone else, just more spiritual, more dedicated, more loving, less judgmental. And if we think of Jesus that way, then we have a chance of getting closer to being like Jesus, and what a time to try that out in the time of Lent. And if we do, then maybe what happens is we get to have our own surprising life, a God-filled life, a life where we step out of the tomb of old guilts and shames and old angers and grudges, prejudices and fears, and we step out of that darkness into a surprising life, a surprising life with Jesus lived at it, with it at its fullness. Didn't Jesus say in this same gospel, he came that we might live abundantly, that we might live a full life? I know this is heady stuff, so I'd like to end with a practical word, and it's Lent. So here's the practical bit. I could not open the attachment that told me what Lee was going to do today, but look what I chose for the end of my sermon. It's the same thing Lee used at the opening. How about the spirit leading there? Mm -hmm. So here's your practical bit. I know it's small. Take a picture with your phone. Take it home and try this. Try this stuff for Lent because you never know it. If you try it for 40 days, it might just stick a little bit. Um, you know, in, in Methodism, John Wesley told us we're all going on to perfection. Here's the little way that we can practice doing that thing to fast from hurting words, to fast from sadness, from anger, from pessimism, from worries, from complaints, from pressures, from bitterness, from selfishness, from grudges. And maybe even fast from words, maybe I need to learn that one. So I hope that your Lent will be a holy Lent. And I do encourage you to, even if you decided you were giving up chocolate already, to take something on and, and take on these words of Pope Francis and choose, you know, if you can't quite manage them all, you know, choose three. Go with three to start off with um, and try and see if you can spend this Lent becoming a little bit more like I think Lazarus was meant to be, that perfect disciple. Because we're told that when we are aiming to be our best and aiming to do everything we can, Jesus is with us, ready to help us live each day anew and help us to be our best. I wish you that holy Lent. May it be a time for all of us of searching and renewal, for there is life in this old story yet, and it's a surprising, and it's an unexpected life. Amen. I think now we have the offertory coming forward. Oh.
I think we have our final hymn now, is that right? Oh. Announcements, I've forgotten the announcements, I beg your pardon. Um, on our journey together with Christ, questioning, serving, and growing, there are a number of announcements in the bulletin. I'd just like to point out a couple. Um, there's one whole page with all of the Lenten Bible studies. There's another page that's kind of a red, brown color, and it's a contest to name an acronym for the word churros. You have until April 15th to do that. Um, I have a couple of other, other things to point out. We are desperately in need of volunteers for coffee hour. Um, if you would like to help out and haven't done so, we will find someone to help you. But any questions, Lee Canton, Lee's in the second row with the red shirt on today. Um, the other announcement that I'd like to point out, we'd like to get additional volunteers to help with worship. If you'd like to do um, welcome, call to worship, read the scripture. Um, please see Pastor Judy when you have a chance. Thank you. And please join me in our final hymn. And it's from the United Methodist Hymnal 707, and it's Hymn of Promise. Thank you. because the story no longer makes sense to them anymore. For them, we need to know how to tell the story again, and that's not easy in words. The way we can all do it is by our deeds, how we live our lives. I'm asking Paul to put that slide up again so that you can take a picture of it or choose one or two of those things that you can do in the coming weeks for there is life in this old story life in it still to this day it's a surprising life it's an expected life and i ask you to live it in jesus name go in peace and may we all share the love of god with those we meet every day amen